Welcome to Coffee with a Googler. I'm here today to talk with Christine Robson, who's a research PM for machine learning. We're going to talk about what's new and exciting in the field of machine learning, including Project Magenta, which is all about machine learning for generating music. We'll also take a look at some of the things that are happening in YouTube, as well as advances in image recognition. So that video, that was an artist who did a cover of a track that was generated by computer, is that yes, right? Yes, exactly. So the piano that you were hearing, that's us. That's the machine learned music. That's the generative model, the TensorFlow model, coming up with a piano track. And then we put this out there as part of our open sourcing efforts to put all this generative music models that we're doing online. Right. And these artists, they, they listened to the music, they were interested in it, they were inspired by it, and they decided to sort of jam along with our music track. Were you expecting somebody to do that? No, we weren't expecting that at all. It was it was really very exciting. We got all we got all excited in the office. We're all like passing the video around, taking a look. It, it was it was really pretty exciting. But this is what we we hope will happen, right? Um, that we can use machine learning for these really creative purposes and really get a partnership going where artists and creators want to work with machine learning tools to to be more creative and have fun. Right. I, I remember you said something once, it's like not about replacing music, it's like almost like inspiring musicians. Yeah, exactly. And, and something, um, you know, Doug, who's the lead on this project, he talks about this all the time, that it's not that we're trying to make the best music out there. I mean, I'm not even a musician. I, you know, it's that we're trying to make tools that the best musicians can use, tools that, that spur this kind of creativity. And the Magenta project, um, that's the project that was open sourced that uh, that we generated this music from. The Magenta Project's really about making those tools for creators. Okay. Um, you know, starting with music, but you know, we want to have tools for creators to do art generation, to do videos. You know, to really tackle all of these questions of, of how can you how can you be creative and work with a machine learned model to to make yourself more creative. And now for this piece of music, it was I recognized the first bars was like twinkle twinkle little star, right? yeah. and then it took over from there. Exactly. So we give it this quick bar, like dun 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 dun, okay. and then the model is trained over a huge swath of music, everything from Bach to the Beatles, and it's just trying to predict what the next note should be. Okay. So, <clears throat> but it uses a type of uh, type of machine learning called a recurrent neural network. Okay. So it looks backwards in time over the music that's been played already and tries to predict sequentially what the next note should be. Okay. Based on all the music it's seen before. So you give it just a couple of notes to get it started and then it just takes off. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It is and, really cool. <laughs> and this was built with Magenta. Yes. Right. So, and I know you're a product lead for Magenta and could you like if somebody wanted to get started with Magenta and maybe start inspiring other people in some other kind of art form or maybe with music, how would they go about doing this? So everything from Magenta is online. We have a GitHub, it's part of the TensorFlow project. So if you go to the TensorFlow slash Magenta um, on GitHub, um, you can go and you can download all of the tools. Um, we encourage everyone to download, to contribute, to, to play with what we've got there and see if they can they can do something creative too. I mean, that's why we've put it out there. Nice, and, and it's not just music, right? There are other art forms too? Well, right now we've been focusing the project on music, but the okay. tools are very general, right? The tools are really about generative machine learning. This idea of generating music, generating art, This the tools to create rather than just making predictions with machine learning. Okay, cool. And like machine learning, of course, it's not just incubation. It's, it's, it's in use in the real world already. Like, like things like YouTube are using it for recommendations. When you think about a machine learned model and you think about all of the possible data that can go into it and mm -hmm. all of the places where the signals are going to come from, if you can capture more signals than you might be able to think of as human, you can do better than a rule-based system. Right. And there's also this notion in, it's a very hard concept to explain, there's this notion of embeddings in computer in computer science and machine learning research where you you capture a you, cap, you, you put a way to capture all of this information together. You capture relationships which aren't easy to describe by simple human labels. Okay. Like maybe the relationship between these two things is really easy to explain. You can imagine writing a rule for it. Like, you know, I really like cat videos, so maybe you'd say like this cat video is similar to this other cat video. They both contain cats. They're both you know both from Japan, something like this. Mm -hmm. um, but then there might be other factors that are really hard for a human to suss out. Like 
Maybe what I really like about this is sort of a abstract feel about the video, the way in which I like watching the cat jump in and out of the box. And that kind of abstract feel translates to this totally other, also kind of cute video involving pandas on slides. Right. And these two things are related, but it's hard to put your tongue on exactly why. Yep. But they're obviously related, and they're related for everybody who looks at these YouTube videos. And that's something that a machine learned model can capture really easily, especially with these embeddings that we use, and that it's really hard for a human to write a rule for. Right, got it. So it's like if you like X, you might like Y, and you may not realize it, but when you have all these variables coming out of an ML model, that you know, it can actually show you that, and you can actually learn that about yourself. Yes, it's exactly. It's like an emergent type thing. It does feel this. emergent sometimes. These notions of, of ideas that you wouldn't have thought really mattered for your, your preferences, like mm -hmm. things that I might not have realized I wanted to see in a YouTube video, like how I want to spend my time, that I really like this particular niche kind of cat yeah. video. It's, I've discovered lots of music that I like in that way, where it's like I'm watching one piece of music and then it suddenly goes on to something else on the playlist of somebody I've never even heard of in a style that I probably don't even like. But mm -hmm. Hey, that's not bad. <laughs> you know that that type of thing. So yeah, and so. we actually do that. We do machine learning for like music, music list curation. So actually, the um, the lead on the Magenta project, Doug, his uh, his role at Google before we started this project was in the music recommendation system. You know, he's oh. a musician. He's got a real passion both for machine learning and for music. And so we spent a lot of time working on how to predict what music you're going to really enjoy listening to based on what music you already like. Right. And looking not just at a very simple thing like which people like the same kind of music, but actually analyzing the structure of the music and understanding how different musical pieces are related to each other in sort of subtle ways and fundamental ways and being able to to really do a very curated playlist for you that finds things that you're going to be interested in. So I understand that YouTube, it's done so well with this kind of stuff. It's even won some awards, is that right? Yeah, so um, you, you don't think when you're a computer scientist that you're going to be working in a field that gets an Emmy. Um, <laughs> but actually, YouTube won an Emmy for personalized video recommendations. Oh, wow. uh, it was a technical Emmy. And hey, an Emmy's an Emmy. I know, it's true. Um, and this was awarded because we do such a good job of personalizing video recommendations. You know, when I see that perfect cat video, yep. that's because we're doing such a good job prioritizing what you want to watch and prioritizing how to find the perfect video for you in this moment. So then, like, so going beyond like recommendation engines and that mm -hmm. kind of thing, one of the things I keep reading about is how ML is now used for image recognition and for attributing images. And uh, I know you've been involved in that a little bit. Could you tell us about it? Yeah. So um, if you haven't used the Google Photos app, you should use the Google Photos app. It's it's my new favorite thing. Uh, I love that I can pick up my phone and ask it to find me photos of my son, ask it to find me photos of my son, you know, playing with my cat, and that it has this great model where it knows, you know, it can do face detection and find my son for me, it can do detection on my cat and find my cat for me, and it does this because it's seen, we, we've fed this model all of the images we've seen from the web of all of the different kinds of cats, and it has this model built up where it sort of knows what a cat looks like, and so it can label it very effectively. So, like one of the things like about image recognition is, I remember you had like I read something from you, like even talking about a cat, and it could recognize a cat's face even though the cat didn't have ears, and oh. the ears are one of the most distinctive parts of a cat. Right? Yeah, that's my cat. Um, so a few years ago, my cat, who lives in California, of course, and suntans all the time, um, she got some skin cancer in her ears. Oh, She's okay. fine now, okay. um, but we had. We had to have the vet had to remove her ears to, to clear the cancer. And so she looks a little bit funny now. She's still really cute, but she's got no ears, and she looks less like a cat than you might <laughs> imagine. Um, but our image recognition software is fine. Like, it can still recognize her as a cat. And so if I ask my phone for photos of my son and my cat, like, still it, still, it still recognizes that she's a cat and can find her. And it's this kind of this flexibility that you get from training a model with a lot of different data, you know? Mm -hmm. There's not probably a lot of examples of cats with no ears on YouTube, but we can sort of extrapolate when we use these really powerful, deep neural network models to sort of, we know, we know basically what the cat should look like, and so we can extrapolate past things like the fact that she doesn't have ears anymore. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad she's doing well, though. Yes. A couple of months ago, we had uh, Joshua Gordon on the show, and there was one thing that he said to me that I thought was really fascinating, and that was he was talking about like three, four, five years from now, the skills of machine learning and the techniques of machine learning will be as important to developers as like JavaScript or SQL are today, and it's like, and I think he was right, and it's 
I would love to inspire people to go out and do more into this, like learn more about machine learning, do things such as creating music or art or who knows what other kind of things they'll come up with. And I know you've got a wealth of resources and I just, what kind of things would you ask developers to take a look at? Well, of course, I'm very passionate about this because machine learning is my passion. But uh, I do think that Josh is right. You know, we've talked about this a lot, but the Thinking about machine learning is so different than thinking about other traditional kinds of software engineering, right? I often make the analogy that the difference between like functional programming and object-oriented programming, that, that paradigm shift, is much smaller than the shift of thinking about machine learning versus thinking about traditional programming methods. So this, this shift is very big and very important, and that's why we want everybody to be together on it from the beginning. That's why we're putting so much effort into open sourcing our tools, really open sourcing the best of everything we've got to try and get everybody together around this. So developers in the outside world can already get the best of Google. Yes. Right? <laughs> Which is just mind-blowing when you think about it. Yeah. And I mean, this is why we've put so much work into open sourcing TensorFlow and why we really want to put this all out there. It's so important to think about what you can do with machine learned models because I really think this is going to be transformative for the kinds of things we can do. I mean, everything from you know YouTube where you're predicting the next video or other, other angles you can think of that affect your sort of day-to-day -day life to these more esoteric creative things like music generation, right? Mm -hmm. Things where you really want to have the best tools at your disposal and you really want to be able to be as creative as possible. And machine learning is going to enable all of these things. So we want everybody to be really fluent. Yeah, I just thoroughly recommend it for anybody, any developers out there, just go take a look at the sites that we've linked below. There's some fabulous stuff out there and you're getting ready for the future. So thank you so much, Christine. This has been awesome. Thank you, it was a real pleasure chatting with you. We had a lot of fun. <laughs>